I mean, the best way now is to hibernate. <laughs> hibernate, keep cash, running things on profit, and optimize, uh, clean up. I think that this is the theme, clean up phase. Cleaning up the culture, cleaning up the people, cleaning up the way we work, efficiency, productivity, you know, remove the fat out. Yeah. Um, just to hibernate until the timing, just to survive. Yeah. yeah. Survive is the word. Yeah. Welcome to the pod. And today I've got with me uh, Top, CEO of BitCup, Thailand's leading cryptocurrency exchange, and also Thailand's first fintech uh, unicorn in Thailand. Today we basically discuss stories of founders who have scaled beyond eight figures. And yeah. Thank you for having me, Mark. Awesome. I wore a black jacket today because <laughs> to try and match you because you always wear a black jacket. <laughs> So I think, you know, you've explained your story many times before, you know, in, in other videos and, and podcasts. I want to talk about the rapid growth of BitCup, you know, achieving unicorn status, you know, in under four years. Can you tell me a little bit about sort of that journey and, you know, the things that you went through? Sure. So BitCup has been around for five years and five months up to date in total. The company has been growing at a thousand percent every year. Uh, in the first three years. So we grew from 3 million Thai baht revenue to 33 million Thai baht revenue, that's 10x, right? And then to 350 million Thai baht revenue. And then on the fourth year, we grew 2,000% to 6.6 billion Thai baht in revenue. And then last year, we took a 50% drop dive um, in revenue to roughly 3 billion Thai baht. Um, so in the peak year in 2021, uh, the company made $200 million in revenue uh, with $100 million in net profit. So we had a 50% profit margin. We almost completed the biggest deal in the Thai banking history right, at the $1.2 billion valuation. Right? Um, but with, even without the deal, um, with a PE of 10 on the net profit, that would take BitCup at a to to the one billion dollar mark, um, but usually a company that is growing at a thousand percent every year, two thousand percent on the last year, a PE ratio won't be at ten, right? Otherwise, the PEG ratio would be way way under one. The company has no debt. We we never let we never leverage on debt, and a unique story about BitCup is that we only raised. $10.7 million up to date. And we only used $2.3 million before we became profitable. And we never touched the rest of the money. And we have been growing the company on cash since. So the company has been profitable for three years now. A second unique story about BitCup is that we have no VC, no institutions, no venture capital uh, funds, only angels. Like my dad's friends who are selling clothes in Pertuna Center area, so we, um, our cap table is still full of like angel investors, and we only um, diluted thirty percent up to date, uh, whereas the the majority uh, of the shares are still with the founders and the co-founders and, and the ESOP working team. Um, and another unique point for BitCup's uh, strategy uh, is that, um, you know, the conventional wisdom for startups is to, to, to be a unicorn, you have to have multiple offices, to, have, to be a regional multi, um, global company from day one. Uh, BitCup has only been in Thailand. Um, we only have one office and we only have one focus, which is Thailand, but we fully conquered, fully conquered Thailand with 99% market share. And we have nine operating entities now, with the and the exchange, the regulated exchange, being one in one out of the, out of the nine operating entities. So we built we built out the the whole ecosystem of blockchain digital assets related. So we also have NFT marketplace. We also have um, BitCup Next, which is in uh, crypto wallet as a service. So we we can white label, and we can list, uh, we can tokenize, we can list coins. Uh, uh, for our other corporations. We have BitCup Metaverse. We have uh, BitCup Chain, our own chain, with CupCoin as, as its operating system. 
uh, we have BitCup Academy to create an open edu education system platform. Right? We have BitCup Ventures, uh, which is quite funny because I'm also in the uh, Innovation Club in Thailand, um, founded by Kun Go Chanun, the CEO and the founder of Ananda, the, the leading real estate company here. Uh, and we had the Thai SEC Stock Exchange of Thailand, the Bank of Thailand. We had all, we have many different members from, from the government, from the private sectors. And in 2021, they showed on the report that Thai startups, only three startups out of the whole country in 2021, was able to receive uh, seed money. Three, right, the whole country, from like. From from you know the the funder the the corporations VCs, but Bitcoin Ventures you know alone invested more than all the other corporations combined in the Thai startup ecosystem. We have invested 15 already in the past two years on the seed stage. Bitcoin Group started uh, in 2018, early 2018. Um, I think that was the last wave of. Thai tech startups because uh, the tech accelerator was still around, AIS incubator was still almost in the blink of closure back then. They were ecosystem build builders, right? Um, but now they are no longer here. And in 2020, 21, 22, there are barely any new startups uh, happening or, or being founded. And most of the companies founded like five years, six years ago. Only a few that are still fostering, the rest are no longer here. Uh, we have two scale-ups after 10 years in this industry. So we have Flash, right, as the first unicorn and, and BitCup as a leading, you know, fintech uh, player. As a, two scale-ups, but the others are not really surviving. So we had the obligations, I think, to reinvest our profit into other startups to, okay. to build an eco ecosystem. Yeah. And BitCup was not your first venture, was it? No, no. BitCup is my second, second venture. crypto venture. Okay. After Coins. Coins. My first company was Coins, C-O-T-H, Coins yeah. uh, in 2013. Uh, so it was, I was one of the very first Bitcoin advocates in, in the country, um, oh, 10 years ago now. Yeah. And I, st I founded that company in, in my parents' clothing shop. My, my parents sell clothes. That's why my, my, my dad's friend, who also sells <laughs> clothes, invested in Bitcoin. So I start from like a spare room on the second floor with a Toshiba laptop, the one that I did my wow, thesis on. that's amazing. And did you always build, so you eventually sold to Gojek, right? Gojek acquired that company. Did you build it with the sale in mind or did that come later on? We wanted to be the first unicorn in Asia back then. And we also uh, we are a strong believer of, of Bitcoin technology, even up to today. Today, yeah. right? but back then we were the initial you know Bitcoin believer, where nobody understood what Bitcoin was. People yeah. thought it was a Ponzi scheme, but that first company was tough because imagine like Bitcoin nine years, eight years ago. People thought it was Ponzi scheme, drug money, you know, money laundering. It was too new, right? Yeah, and and we had all the fires coming at us, all the crisis. We had issues with the anti-money laundering officers, right? We had we got an in investigation letter back then, an issue with the Bank of Thailand, and even an issue with the RD Revenue yeah. Department on how to how to pay taxes, how how to set up a reporting system on all the transactions. You know. And what was the reason to sell it? You know, why not keep coins going for the long term? I think we had um, partly uh, because Gojek wanted to enter the e-wallet space back then. They, they started with the ride sharing right? and they wanted to, to enter into the e-wallet space and the, the operations in the Philippines were growing very fast like CoinsVH and they wanted to enter the, the Philippines market. Sure. Too. We had three uh, co-founders right, at Coins and um, I think our vision started to diverge. Uh, I wanted to create a, you know, a stock exchange 2.0, uh, 
And I we saw the you know I saw the potential of blockchain beyond just an, just to create an e-wallet company with fiat being the majority part, right? Um, so you can either be an e-wallet and try to uh, be the uh, the payment apps in the country with Bitcoin as and trans- uh, a transactional protocol to to disrupt the Western Union money transfer part, or you can either create a proper financial platform. Sure. Right? Um, so I guess you saw like the level ten opportunity, right? As yeah, opposed to a more scalable just the wallet. Yeah. Yeah, a more impactful, more scalable technology uh, uh, business models. So in 2018, I participated in the first Thai FinTech Challenge uh, from the SEC. They had their first Thai ever FinTech Challenge. So I joined and I named the team Private Chain and we created the first Stock Exchange 2.0 where you can settle stock T plus zero days. Back then in Thailand, is T plus three days yeah. for stock settlement. And we became the winner of that uh, Thai SEC's FinTech Challenge. Um, everyone was amazed, right? Um, I remember the Minister of Finance saw, saw our team, our video, the SEC, even the Stock, stock Exchange of Thailand. Um, and after we became the winner, I wanted to, ch- to turn this into a real business. But the SEC was a bit shy and they, they said that their own regulation doesn't allow private companies to create a, stock, a competing stock exchange in Thailand. So they, then they started with a sandbox. So I joined the sandbox uh, program, worked closely with them. And partly because of luck, um, you know, in 2017, Bitcoin price started to increase, to grow from $600 to the peak was $20,000 in early 2018. And the Minister of Finance ordered the Thai SEC to regulate the space. And we already got a jump start on, on the sandbox. So they, we kind of, I was working closely with the, the old team of the SEC to turn this sandbox into a proper license. And once I know that the license, the first ever digital asset exchange license was, license was about to come out, I started to fundraise. And I turned that private chain into um, BitCup today. Uh, this was in, yeah. So we started our journey in 2018, and we w- we w- we were able to raise 2.1 million dollars at a seed stage. It was the biggest seed round back yeah. back in the Thai startup history back then, at a 16 million dollars valuation. And so that's a Series A valuation already. So we, o- we overvalued the company by a lot, and I took some of the of that money to acquire an IT company. Okay. And turn that into um, to save time for all the office space, the engineers. So I asked them to stop working on whatever they're doing and quickly launch BitCup before yeah. uh, before the license comes out. So we have we would have this grandfather period, right? And we were the first to receive the license in Thailand, and uh, there were th- a few operators back then. Three three main operators. For I think for BitCup, BX, Satan coins, and, yeah. and we became the winner. Um, uh, and partly because we know the game we are in, we are not trying to spread ourselves thin in different no- yeah. countries. It's not a marathon game; it's a sprint game, which is yeah. quite controversial. People yeah. said that you know running a stab is like a, running a marathon. But play the long game, play, the infinite game. Yeah, infinite game, but. But we know that we're in the monopoly, local monopoly um, business models. We have to reach the end uh, first to, in terms of the, the network effect and the economy of scale because of the uh, platform business. Right? What was the, I guess, the, the growth drivers for BitCup to become a category leader in Thailand very quickly? Um, I think a combination of different factors. Uh, I think the first factor, who who was it that said do things that don't scale at the start? Um, was it the founder of LinkedIn, yeah. right, Reeve Hoffman? Maybe Reeve, Reeve Hoffman said uh, it's quite controversial, but at the start of this early stage of your company, do things that don't scale. So I 
literally gave talks uh, for more than a thousand stages in in the past six years. Yeah, <laughs> trying to educate the public. You know, being the biggest Bitcoin advocate uh, continuously for ten years now. Um, uh, even today, I mean, I stopped talking about Bitcoin and blockchain for almost three years now. My face is still a crypto face in Thailand. <laughs> yeah. So, so I go stage by stage, you know, do things that don't scale, you know, giving the right education, trust, re- reliable reliability. And also partly because of my first company, I had customers with me uh, from day one. And everyone knows the story that now BitCup is my second one. And I'm someone approachable. They see me on every stages. I'm not going to run away with people's money. And I always show my face behind the company, you know, show who are the backers, who are the founders, um, just to provide transparency and trust. I think that's one factor. You guys were also doing a a shitload of advertising as well, right? Yes. Because your face was literally on every poster in Bangkok. Yeah. So that's another factor, I think. Uh, timing we know the timing partly because we've been in this space space for the longest time in Thailand we know that once every four years there is a golden year usually six months after after the Bitcoin halving occurs so in 2020 the first of May 2020 that was the, the last halving so did you phase things keeping the halving in mind and knowing when to time right awareness okay so after the last halving, 1st of May 2020, uh, we decided to, knowing that after, in six months' time, there'll be a, a, sp- a surge in, in Bitcoin prices, statistically, right, speaking, if you look at the historical data. So we put out like crazy budgets on marketing campaigns. And if you remember, you would see, people would see me everywhere, on every billboard, every elevator. Uh, I was bombarding everyone. <laughs> from the moment they people wake wake up from their phone their laptop elevator on the road on the way back home to the time they go to bed uh, i think i'm the second most seen person in thailand apart yeah. from the king in 2021 <laughs> for two years yeah bombarding everyone for two years so when the timing you know arrives people can only think of us because <laughs> because we indoctrinate we indoctrinate like the public for two years so uh, Bitcoin is almost becoming a household name in Thailand. Right? People usually interchangeably use Bitcoin for Bitcoin. Right? Almost becoming like Google, like a household word. Not like a, Kleenex for like tissue. Right. Yeah. We ha- I mean, we're not the best at marketing for sure, but we, just, we have the best timing. Right? If you see our billboards and if you, if you were to look back, it's, it's not the best billboard, billboards no, ever. No, we're not. It's not our expertise. We're not designing the best billboards for, to, for uh, but but we had the best launch, the best timing. So the ROI was was perfect, uh, great, um, and we play our strategy right. During the crypto summer, uh, it, it's best to put a lot on the marketing budget because you get the best return on investment on on marketing but during the crypto winter that's when you shift your budget to product products and r&d research and development and engineers to build out the infrastructure ready for the next wave it's a cyclical business so we we also played the right strategy Um, i think that's the second factor and the third factor was the team I mean, apart from the timing, um, apart from do things that don't scale at the start, and then the third factor would be the team. Um, I gathered everyone I know in the space in Thailand to join BitCup. Um, so we, I had a team that complements what I don't have, the skills that I don't have, um, but also a team that compromises just curious what are the skills you don't have oh well, many many things uh, like, um, for example um, I can't code <laughs> right engineers right and I know that uh, to run a money business you have to have a strong compliance and legal backgrounds 
right? So I need a... Your background is finance, right? Yeah, finance, economics. Economics. And also strong operations. Obviously, I know to the very details on how to run an operation because I did everything myself from the first company. Right? I wore every hat before. But to allow me to go out and give speeches every day, a thousand speeches, to allow me the, the time to think and strategize. I need a daily operating operating person. So, and since I've been training like, with staff from the previous companies for, for like five years, uh, we all speak the same language now, the same experiences that we have been through, all the different crises. So everyone allows me to be hands off and I can just give them directions and, and details, but the one taking actions are my previous team. So I think I had the best team that allows me to do things that don't scale. And people are wondered, how do I achieve like a tremendous growth, but, but you, they see me on stages every day. And that's because of the previous companies that um, experience, right? Um, I don't have to repeat the same, mista- the same mistakes yeah. that, I, that I did. I never get to the, 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 the road before. Um, so a second time around, it's much, it's much quicker. And also I had the same team, right? Um, that, and that's the secret. Um, but that's what people don't understand, right? that um, you don't, uh, right, success is not an overnight thing. And people usually just linked it uh, on the current company, but you know, founders or entrepreneurs is usually a continuous journey. You connect the dots, right? right? Like Steve Jobs saying backwards, like Steve connecting the dot, dot backwards. That's what Steve Jobs was saying. So tell me a little bit about you know, you, you talked about people and BitCup scaling up so fast, you know, you really have to have a really strong team. You talked about having a strong leadership team and, and, and founders and, you know, you filling gaps for, you know, with different team members fulfilling your, your weaknesses. I remember we had a dinner a while back and you mentioned to me, you know, at that point in time for you, it was a situation of hire fast, fire no one. Yeah. In order to maintain the headcount, to be able to deal with okay. the the volume of, right. of business, you know, how, how was that that for you? Because it's quite controversial. Because in typical business circles, it's all about hiring slow and firing fast. You right. know, making sure people have are the right fit for the for the company and right. its values, and finding the right skill sets. So, tell me more about that. Um, I mean, fire, hire slow, fire fast uh, is the right philosophy long term. But we have to understand the different phases of, of the business, right? Um, during this, the very early phase, we can call it a wartime period, right? So we, you have to be a wartime CEO. And as a wartime CEO, you react uh, in one way and you have one strategy, right? And during a blitz scaling phase, then you can't really wear a wartime CEO hat. And you have to have a, another strategy, right? And during a peacetime phase, you have to wear a peacetime CEO hat. And you have to have you have to have one strategy for that. Um, so um, during the blitz scaling phase, that's when we hire super fast and we fired no one because. Imagine we had 40,000 customers opening new accounts every day. 40,000. Have you been to like a stadium full of people? Football stadium. That's <laughs> yeah. like the amount of people per day. Like tomorrow there's another stadium coming, right? Full of people. So how can we fulfill even a very basic function of the company, right? opening accounts, by hiring slow? The company cannot function. Right? The company would collapse. Right you have away. to do manual reviews, right? When people sign up. Yes, it's part of the again to do a money business, right? Um, you have to comply with local regulations. Um, in other words, you can't c- cut corners. It's not like you're creating a, a company that sells a T-shirt online. What's the worst that can happen? You lose a T-shirt, maybe. But when you're in a money business, things can go very wrong, which happened last year to many 
exchanges and many companies who 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 were cutting corners and that's you you should never cut corners when you do a money when you run a money business um things will come back and bite you right? you can never never erase histories so uh that's why we had to to hire everyone we know and fire no one because we need to feel fulfill basic function for the company to be functional we're not talking about like yeah great company versus good company we are not talking about quality anymore we're talking about basic functionality of the company so we had to ful- fulfill the basic needs first right so we we were adding 200 headcounts every month for a year right so we grew from 2000 people to sorry we grew from 200 people to 2000 people in one year the more i speak to founders the more i hear of their challenges of being able to hire people and the right people fast right how did you guys approach that well to be frank we're not hiring the right people we're just hiring people to fulfill the basic bombs on seats <laughs> <laughs> yes it's i mean knowing in internally that we had to clean up eventually but we need to capture the growth first we're not going to let the growth pass by right? we we want to do everything to capture the growth and we will clean things up later which is very painful but but that's what the the strategy of blitz scaling is right when you you you're optimizing for growth rather than your margin or the culture or the people right you want to capture you have to as sacrifice, much growth yeah. right but usually a company that can blitz scale scales are, are companies with high profit margin so for bitcup we had 50% profit margin with you know inefficiency an extra inefficiency of 10% and extra expense you know unnecessary expenses of 10% it's fine so long as we can capture 2000% growth it would offset the rest right with 50% profit margin we're still okay with 30% uh, you know buffer so um i think we have to play a different roles as CEOs depending depending on the phases that the company is in but once you are fully cap- captured the growth now it's time to clean up you know i still believe in the that making sure the top line uh right there are three things right on the top line the uh the people the culture or the environment right and the strategy and once you focus on the, on the top line the like steve jobs was saying the bottom line will come right for distribution you figure your product you you figure your distribution your profit eventually you just focus on making sure the top lines are correct so during the peace time period that's when you wear another hat as a ceo you're not focusing on growth as a keyword here you're focusing on sustainability as a keyword and to run a company in a sustainable manner again it requires a, to- a totally a totally different skill sets you have to think about cg good governance you know esg right uh, we we take the s and the g mostly from esg s stands for actually it's s stands for stakeholders management not just social or community um bitcup last year we in 2021 we made more profit than the thai stock exchange right uh net profit not revenue um and in terms of volume or the number of customers 5 million up to today we have we are becoming a cii country's critical information infrastructure meaning that if anything happens to the company it there could be a systematic risk to the thai economy right we have like 2 3 billion dollars of customers deposits with us now right thailand is a, is a small economy this is already a big infrastructure already a, we com- we are becoming a public infrastructure meaning that we can't move fast break things apologize later right like other startups um so we need to focus on cg and see and uh for the s once you are becoming a cii or a public infrastructure you can't focusing on just making sure your customers are happy just like the conventional wisdom right can't being a customer obsession company or you're not maximizing just the value for the shareholders 
or you're you're not making making just your employees happy and everything would be fine. Those are like conventional belief. But when you becoming when you are becoming a public infrastructure, there are other stakeholders you have to manage. Right? You have to manage the press and the media um, because you're on the spotlight. You have impact on many lives in the country now. Right? You have to manage uh, the regulators to make sure they're happy because we're obviously becoming an infrastructure that impacts the public. Right? The their regulations for sure. Right? You have to make sure that the government. Are happy, right? You have to manage the government with the make sure making sure they are launching policies that are in line with where the world is heading, right? Um, you have to make sure your business partners are happy because once we're big, everyone wanted to, everyone reached out to us to partner, partner up, making sure local partners are happy, making sure international partners are happy. Then we have to manage the the elite group and the a- academics group because their critiques and You know, academia um, comments on on the our technology and um, where we are heading, uh, what we are doing for Thailand, and we have to manage social and community CSR, giving back to society. You know, growing the startup ecosystem. It takes time, uh, but eventually, if you are focusing on managing the all the nine, ten stakeholders beyond just three. They will tran- it will translate into a higher profit in the long run. Right? That's S, but G is a h- huge part too. Um, you, you, I mean, during a wartime CEO, that's when you lead by authority and control, and because you have you don't have two two years of runway to figure out your business models, like b r e v e Hoffman was saying, jumping off a cliff and assemble assemble a plane on the way down. Um, you have to do whatever it takes for the company to be to be profitable before you can raise Series A. Because Series A is all about unit economics, right? Um, but when in a peacetime, right, you can't focus on purely on efficiency or productivity. You have to focus on risk, you know, decentralization, succession planning. You have to forego efficiency for sure, for you know, as more resilience resilience process. And uh, resilient resilience company, um, so you put in board structure. You have to have a, a you know board uh, separated from the management team, and the board must consist of you know diversity from com- people from coming from different backgrounds, and one third of the board members ha- have to be independent directors, and, and the chairman of the per- board has to be lead independent directors. And you have to separate the role between the chairman. And a CEO, right? you have to have subcommittees. You have to have whistleblower mechanism. You have to change the way you work. Right? Working in a sustainable company versus a growth company versus a startup. <laughs> There are three different skill sets and three different ways of working and communicating. Yeah, and it sounds like you've been through all of those stages very quickly. You're uh, 33 now. Yeah. Wow. Um, how have you? You know, because companies require different types of, let's say, CEOs at different stages, right? Right. How have you been able to learn so rapidly and adapt so quickly to, you know, wearing the wartime CEO hat, the peacetime CEO, and having to deal with all of this like governance and regulation? How do you, how have you been able to manage that? Very badly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not scaling myself yeah. fast enough. And I always learn from the previous chapters' mistake, not knowing that I am already entering another chapter of the company. Uh, not forward-looking, but backwards, like correcting, and that's not good. Not good. For example, uh, I think in I think in year two, uh, in 2019, second year into the company, um, at the end of of year two, Bitcup had. Two months of runway left. You know, the first mistake that I did as a founder was to overvalue the company. Um, you know, I value the company at at sixteen million dollars valuation with just a piece of paper. Right? We were able to raise that two point one million at sixteen million dollars valuation. That is Series A valuation already, 
but we are already only at the presentation stage. So knowing that we raised this much, we have to scale, we have to grow much faster than tr traditional startups. Right? And I'm not paying myself for 10 months because that's not good ROI, return on investment, because no, we have to justify the valuation by growing faster than other companies. Sure. And we achieved two, a thousand percent growth for two consecutive years, but we're almost reaching the down round, right? not growing fast enough. Do you, do you feel like the added pressure of overvaluing the company made you work harder? Yes, we worked like seven days a week and not paying ourselves any money because... So pressure is good? <laughs> uh, I mean, it was painful. <laughs> <laughs> it's not so painful now, though. <laughs> I mean, painful, but but tasteful life, like meaningful, meaningful. impactful. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely not an average life. Um, it's an adventure rest one. Right? Um, so we, we overvalued the company. And at one point, BitCup had two months of runway left. And the only offer on the table uh, was a down round. And we decided to, I decided to reject the offer because it's not good for everyone, not good for the initial investors that believed in me, not good for the founders. And we almost, you know, closed down the company um, with mon one month left. I think uh, one, one of the angels is inject the money with a little bit uh, in increase in the valuation to not face the down round. And then after that experience, on the third year, not knowing that I'm entering a blitzscaling phase, right? Thinking that oh, I'm still in the wartime phase. Right? You know, to grow to grow two thousand percent on a base that is already big, it's like it requires a lot of capital um, and time. But we don't have the time, and but but we have the capital. But I was paranoid of running a loss on my. PNL. So I squeezed every penny on the third year, right? Uh, and we were able to grow one thousand percent from thirty-three million Thai baht to three hundred and fifty million Thai baht, right? And that third year was it's the roughly a million dollars, right? Three three hundred and fifty to ten million dollars. Yeah. Okay, ten million dollars in, yeah. in revenue. And I squeezed all the expenses, efficiency, uh, efficiency, productivity expenses down to the very penny because I'm scared of making a loss now. And that third year was the first ever year that we became profitable. Um, the expense grew to 250 million, so Thai baht. So that year we made 100 million dollars, uh, sorry, 100 million baht. So $3 million of profit. But I was under investing in the infrastructure I was under investing in everything, not knowing that in the fourth year we grew two thousand percent in the um, Bitcoin cycle. You it's, weren't expecting that kind of growth, or you were, but not at that rate. Um, we were expecting, but we uh, we deployed a wrong strategy because of the ex you know, traumatic experience of two months of runway left. We don't want to repeat that experience again. So we want to run the company on cash now, on, on profit. But that's a wrong strategy. And that's not what you do during blitz scaling. So on the, I think the second day of the new year, uh, 2nd of January, the Bitcoin price reached 1 million Thai baht for the first time. And we had 40,000 people coming in to register for an, an account. And I remember the exchange went down, bursted. I remember that. I and think I was complaining with support, like, oh, dear. <laughs> oh my God, that was the worst experience. Um, the SEC gave us five days to bring everything back up, or they will confiscate the license. You know, six months of work, down to five days. So we had no sleep, everyone was sleeping in the office. Um, everyone in the country was complaining. It was on the news in every TV channels, newspapers, because we were under investing in the infrastructures. Right? We were, we wanted to save money. You know that whole year, I think we 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 ended up losing one point, roughly one point seven billion, baht of mistakes of losses. Wow. Right. 
I don't know how much would that be in like fifty million dollars of mistakes, trying to save like pennies, right? Squeeze every penny, but we lose fifty million dollars in the n- next year because we underinvest in many things. And I always learned from the previous chapter, but not forward looking. And again, when we enter the peacetime phase, we have to focus on sustainability, but we are still like pushing on growth. Sure. <laughs> so, so you're still playing catch up, right? Always, always playing looking back up. and and how do you deal with? You know, being 33, I mean, it's still very, very young. And, you know, you have your your highs and your lows. How do you deal with, you know, going through your low periods of, you know, you mentioned things being painful at the time. You know, I'm sure there was a large amount of stress, potentially. How do you deal with those emotions when you're going through those tough times? I still remember in my first company, that was the first startups that I did like 10 years ago. And when things got really heavy for the first time, I had nobody to talk to. I can't talk to my parents because imagine Bitcoin like 10 years ago. They would just say, just why are you laundering money? <laughs> I send you to a very top school. Yeah. Why are you laundering money? Why, why are you running a Ponzi scheme? Right? My parents would just say, come back and help me sell clothes. There's no need for you to risk your yourself. Um, so I can't talk to my parents. I can't talk to my friends. Everyone looked down right, on me. And that was the first. Like, and when we had issues with the anti-money laundering officers, issues with the Bank of Thailand, consecutively in one year, like, boom, you know, the anti-money laundering issues. Like, a few months afterwards, boom, the Bank of Thailand. All right. Um, because we had no, there's no license to operate this business, right? No money, e wallet license, no remittance, no payment license. And then boom, the RD. I still rem- remember the first exper- painful, stressful uh, experience. I took the car to the airport every Friday to Don Mueang Airport. And I would just park the car and I would pick the nearest random flight that was about to leave. And I would fly alone to a random destination for the weekend spent two days alone uh, to think and to that that, that was back then do you still do that now no no but that was i still remember that was the first like really really stressful phase of my life and i i cannot talk to anyone i don't know what ypo is i don't know what eo is it was just a i was just a young entrepreneur right so i did that for seven consecutive weeks on Friday, I would drive to the airport, park the car, pick the ra- a random flight. On Sunday night, I would fly back. And on Monday, I would hustle again. I did that for seven consecutive weeks. Uh, I don't know how to release like stress or concern or worries back then. Um, but I guess human, uh, we are amazing at adjusting. Imagine if you're running a marathon, right? On the first day. You will feel you will feel very bad and very tired. I'm sure you cannot run a marathon from day one, but if you practice every day, you can run longer, and it will be less painful because the body adjusts. Right? Same with issues. <laughs> Once you have bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger issues coming at you every day, you adjust and um, you so will deal with it. And have you grown some pretty thick skin to you know? Yeah, I, we had a very high pain threshold. Um, last year was tough too. I mean, <laughs> so many crises coming at us last year. Uh, all the FTX, Lunar, um, local media a- attacking us, you know, propagandas, the SECs lobbying and everything um, are at, on a new level right? when we are becoming a public, public infrastructure. I, I mean, feel like you've seen, a, seen everything and been through everything that you could probably go through at the highest level because you know speaking to you now meeting with you you know a few times before you're cool as a cucumber <laughs> <laughs> but i'm always constantly like stressed with issues that the body like normalize it like, yeah i, I don't normalize the sure yeah. it's as expected like every year there's n- never a normal year for us and always we have to deal with different issues every year. And even this year, I mean, I mean, last year, Bitcoin was the only company that, that only a handful of company, company that are 
not facing bankruptcy um, or meltdown on you know on the dominoes impact on the cryptocurrency space like all the dust happening I guess the the market would self select self select in the long run um, strongest would survive there'll be a natural selection eventually happening um, people are migrating digital assets to us more now with all the meltdowns happening worldwide um, we are moving towards a uh, regulated exchanges versus unregulated move fast break things players um, and this year we have to deal with, I mean, last year we, we, we I think we are the only company that, that was still profitable, um, which is, which is amazing already, but obviously we cannot compare to our peak year that we did $100 million in net profit. Our profit went down to, I think $12 million yeah. net profit. Um, but the revenue only dropped by 50%. So we still did a hundred million dollars of revenue, but our fixed costs we're not able was not able to come down quick quick enough sure um and this year we have to deal with another issues uh the recession right it's happening worldwide um linkedin um tech companies like uh, google facebook they're letting go of employees do you think we're in a recession now or it's coming i think last month germany officially announced that they're entering a recession and last week the whole eurozone officially announced that they're entering a recession. Um, I mean, we, we, I got these insights from attending, attending Davos for the first time. BitCup is, is a part of World Economic Forum, uh, part of the 11 companies in Thailand attending Davos. Um, and we got the insights since 2022 that um, the Fed would increase the interest rates. They would do everything they can to bring down inflation for the price control. Even even if they have to export a recession everywhere, they, they're going for price stability more than anything else. So that's why in 2022, when I flew back from Davos, I started to tell everyone on the media and every, everyone I know to keep cash, to pay off loan quickly, and to optimize expenses ASAP. Okay. And BitCup did exactly that. We started to keep cash. You know, we, I brought my face down from all the billboards and, and cut down yeah. marketing spending. Uh, and that's why we were the only company profitable because we reacted quickly. But this year is even worse. Um, uh, for, for I think everyone, um, because inflation is not quite down yet. There are a few bank runs happening already. All right, um, Credit Suisse, Silicon Valley Bank, SVB. Do you feel um, like we've seen the bottom yet? Or it's coming um i think the crisis this is my personal personal view yeah personal view um, no financial advice <laughs> yeah no financial <laughs> advice <laughs> we're we're going towards a, a much bigger crisis even worse than 2008 um it's a longer term cycle thing that um ray dalio was saying mm. you see you started to spot patterns like decoupling is happening between the world's leaders like the East and the West, China and the US, Russia, Russia and Ukraine, Ukraine, uh, fragmented worlds. Everyone is rewriting the world's treaty, order, world's order treaty, to make sure that the global South, which for the first time in human history, are growing faster than the global North. Right? The BRICS nations GDP is faster, growing faster than G7 now. So we have to rewrite the treaty uh, because we have a louder voice now, right? developing countries. And many of the issues, global issues, uh, cannot be fixed by the, you know, the, the leading nations alone, the US alone, China alone. We have to have col collaboration at a global scale, not just public and private partnership in one country, but worldwide. So in order to make sure everyone is onboarded, Everyone must feel that they are being heard. So they are re re everyone is rewriting, the leaders are rewriting the treaty, the world, uh, world order. Um, there's a technological war happening, fighting over Taiwan on the computer chip, which is a smaller issue now, but it will lead to a bigger issues in the future because technology determines the future. right? Um, and also, you know, BRICS nation 
is forming their own consortium of currency. They're, they're forming their own BRICS currency for the first time, or even the central banks around the world, um, leading by BIS, the Bank, Bank of International Settlement, Bank, Bank, Central Bank of Central Banks, have been aggregating gold in the past two years, more than what gold. they have been, gold, yeah, in the past two years, more than they have been doing in the past 10 years. So these are like outliers, indicators. And, and if you look at the smaller banks, regional banks in the US, I think more than 300 banks are secretly insolvent, but they're hiding in their balance sheet, right? In their FS, audited FS. Um, they have a special privilege access to credit line from the central bank. Um, I think we're, I mean, how can the US solve the dilemma, right? If, if they don't further increase the debt ceiling, I mean, this is the, I don't know how many times that they are readjusting the debt ceiling, right? And there's a de-dollarization trend happening worldwide, right? OPEC group announced that uh, now you can buy energy without the dollar pairing, right? lift it away from the dollar pairing. I mean, you can use other currencies now. And, and we, haven't even we haven't updated our system since 1971, the post Bretton Wood era, uh, the Nixon shock era, right? the fiat uh, currency. So if you study the evolution of monetary system, it changes every 50 years. 1929, the Great Depression, 1945, the establishment of, establishment of the Britain Wood system, the IMF and the World Bank, 1971, the post Britain Wood system. It changes every 50 years and usually after a crisis. So personally, I think we are updating our system. There'll be a change in uh, the monetary system moving towards digital currency. And also because of net of the net zero uh, initiatives, carbon neutrality, right? Um, we are emitting we are emitting fifty two billion tons per year of greenhouse gas emissions. From fifty two to zero, we have to get to zero. And during COVID, um, where we forego all the economic activities, no hotels, no airports, empty streets and roads, we are still emitting fifty billion tons per year. We only reduce two billion tons of cons by reducing consumption. So clearly, reducing consumption is not the way to go to to get to zero from fifty two to zero. Yeah. So the solution is to have a breakthrough in technology that reduces green premium, so that there are alternative products or services that doesn't emit carbon or any gases from uh, from day one. That's net zero. Right, not carbon neutral. Carbon neutral is when you can just buy carbon credit to offset right, uh, your bad, act, act, bad behaviors. But net zero, you, you cannot emit carbon. Um, and people st only blamed the energy sector for destroying the world. Fossil fuel. But if you look at the statistics, fossil fuel only accounts for 26% of the 52 billion tons per year of greenhouse gas emissions. What about the buildings, the cement, right, uh, 30%? The food we eat, the clothes we wear, right? Um, everything else accounts for 74% of the 52 billion tons. And if you look at the money system, we are still killing trees to make paper money. How are we going to reach net zero? Right? So we have to have an alternative product, a more sustainable you know, transactional protocol that are not destroying the world. Digital currency? Digital, yeah, obviously <laughs> money would be digital for the future. In some countries, even worse, like uh, Australia or New Zealand, they are using plastic for money. That's even worse for the world. So obviously, we have to change the supply, supply chain. We have to have a green supply chain in virtually every sector, not just the fossil fuel, which accounts for 26%. Every, every sector must move towards a more sustainable supply sure. chain. Something bad is coming. If you were to make a guess, of where you would see, I guess, the the floor of a potential recession. I mean, considering we may be in one right now, like where would you sort of estimate we would see like the bottom, like the, I believe it was the crash you sort of like talked about, like the big change event. I hope it will not happen. 
um, at Davos, uh, the leaders were saying that um, inflation must be down to 2% by 2024 roadmap. Nobody talked about 23 or 22. Everyone talks about the 24 roadmap. 2024 inflation must be down to a normal 2% rate. So hopefully then, I, I, hope, I hope we have price control by 2024 so that you know, the, the government can inject capital back into the market again. Um, in economics, we have two different words. Recession versus depression. Recession is, means, usually it means that the economy is down for six months to 18 months, right? But depression is when the economy is down for a decade, 10 years. And the main factor is the debt, debt level, if the debt level is sustainable or not. Right. In, 2000, in 1929, that's what we call the Great Depression, not the Great Recession, Depression. The, econ the economy was down for 10 years until 1939. And the only way we got out of the Depression was via fiscal stimulus, World War II, right? 1939 to 1945. And, but in 2008, there was the Great Recession because the economy was down for 18 months. Right? By 2010, everyone is happy. In, tr in trouble, I'm quite worried because the household debt in Thailand is at an unprecedented level high, highest in history. And if we are keeping, if we are going at this rate, you know, um, the debt, the growth of debt may grow faster than the growth of average income of a household. You know, it could be at, at an uns unsustainable point and we could have a depression, just like in Japan in 1990, right? depression for a long time. Um, I hope, I hope the, the government take action quickly yeah. and have appropriate policies. Okay. So, I mean, from the perspective of CEOs and founders, you know, you were mentioning just to hold cash as much as possible, uh, potentially reduce investment into, I guess, being more conservative rather than growth focused, right? I mean, the best way now is to hibernate. <laughs> hibernate, keep cash, running things on profit and optimize, uh, clean up. I think that yeah. this is the theme, clean up phase. Cleaning up the culture, cleaning up the people, cleaning up the way we work, efficiency, productivity, you know, remove the fat out. Yeah. Um, just to hibernate until the timing, just to survive. Timing, right. Yeah. Survive is the word. Okay. Right. And you talked about, you know, you spending a lot of time doing public speaking. Is that something, you know, founders and CEOs should be doing at the moment in order to, you know, sustain or even try to grow during this period? Um, I mean, it's not one size fits all. Um, I'm operating in a space where nobody un understood what blockchain technology was. So in order to grow the market share, you have to provide the right education. Right? Um, but if the founders are in an already established market, um, you, they have probably have to deploy a different strategy. But communication is is one of the a critical skill of a founder, especially when the company uh, is big. Would you say education as well? Because you said you were doing a lot of education around, yeah. you know, to provide the right context um, is important. Because when the company uh, has you know, two thousand employees, you can't lead by control anymore. You have to lead by the right context. With the right context, everything would translate into into the right action. So communication is becoming a very critical part of a leader. And communication is not just vert direct con communication. Communication has different methods and techniques and dimension um, that the the leaders must master. How have you learned to be a better communicator as as a leader? No, again, very bad. Uh, badly, 
I am I'm the worst. You're very humble. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm seriously I'm the worst at communicating. Uh, you know, public speaking is not communication. It's not. It's just one dimension. But uh, I mean, that's I mean, indoctrination is part of communication, <laughs> right? Um, there are many different dimension to it. I'm not very good at this. I need to improve a lot. Have you ever yeah. suffered from imposter syndrome? Imposter syndrome by by pretending to be someone else. It's like you you're not. If I understand it correctly, like you don't believe you're capable of the position that you're holding. So it's more about like self doubt and doubt that you're actually able to do the things that you do. Never actually. I recently went to the um, uh, psychologist. Not because I have issues, but to bring the best talent out. Okay. Right. Also, like a performance thing, or sh- sh- sure, yes. You know, I mean, I think conventional wisdom is when people go to a psychologist, they have issues. But usually, normal people can go to a psychologist to bring out the best talents too, to know, to understand more about who you are, and and to solve your. Um, all your drawbacks and to bring out your best potential. And I did not know that deep down I'm a I'm a narcissist, right? Um, and there are ways to 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 fix this, right? Um, and maybe that's why I never have self doubts. If I could do, I mean, I think. It, the the entrepreneur's journey started like 10 years ago when I decided to become an entrepreneur. I decided to take one action that I'm scared daily to push my comfort zone. Give an example. It's public speaking. Oh my God. I cannot speak in front of 10 people. My legs would really? be shaking. I hated public speaking. Um, I still remember the first few stages. I had to write my essays, my speech, and I remember word by word. And I practice in front of a mirror like 20 times. And I, I speak like a robot, <laughs> right? yeah. word by word. And I repeat that robot speech for a few stages, shaking. But I push my comfort zone. You know, and after a thousand times, it's, it's like your bread and natural, butter. Yeah, it's your bread and butter. So I guess even at Davos, right? Um, first year at Davos, go, going up on stage at, at, at the biggest stage ever in the world. I wasn't even know that I was. A, I, I had to speak. The opportunity present present itself. I just took the opportunity right away and and just go up on stage because one. Of, I think one of the speakers got sick or something. Um, because I'm not. I'm. I'm way not. I'm. I'm just too junior to speak at a global stage, right? But I mean, just you know, I never have self doubts. Um, I just give my best at everything and never. I mean, I would be, uh, yeah, I would never have regrets okay. if I just give it my best. How many hours are you working now? Is it still the same as before? Um, I'm trying to reduce the number of hours worked. Um, and that's another mistake that I did. You know, during blitz scale, during wartime, you put in, put in the hours. But during the peacetime phase, that's when you have to become a board. Uh, you have to dif- differentiate yourself from short term versus long term. You have to separate yourself between execution versus long term planning, right? And if you're still busy with daily operations, you know, put in the hours, then you don't have time to reflect and think and on strategize the strate- on the strategy and right. think long term. You'll be running like a rat race, uh, like a hamster wheel. And you will not see bigger issues or the trend. You, know, you have to step back and make as little, pos- uh, fewer decisions as possible, because because one mistake can cost uh, the company very expensively uh, compared to when you're a startup. Right? One mistake can cost a lot. Uh, you know, can company huge damage. So you have to make very little. A uh, fewer decision, but accurate as possible. And the only way to, I mean, one way to improve your quality of decision is to make fewer decisions and to cut out the noise 
one thing you know you notice that I wear like suits every day is that I I heard of this theory that um, uh, every day that you wake up you have ninety five percent unconscious mind and five percent a consciousness no, conscious mind you know when you walk to your bathroom you brush your teeth you open your refrigerator those are like unconscious mind. Yeah. And you don't want to waste the five percent conscious mind, right? Every day, the cognitive load of having to select a, a different T-shirt or jacket. Uh, you know, you get tired from <laughs> making decisions. Do you actually have other colored jackets? No. <laughs> I mean, if you see my wardrobe full of white t- white shirts, <laughs> black blazer. Yeah. Um, so I'm. I even. I have. I have seven secretaries now. Wow. Yeah. And, you know, one secretary is that's, devoted to all the non-work related. That's why so, it was so hard to get in touch with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. No, but yeah, apart from saving time, they also help you reduce your the number of decisions you have to make. Like, for example, I need to get a new shirt. Which brand should I get? You know, all these things. She, she would, you know, okay. buy me new shirts. Get Apart from saving time on redundant stuff. Also reduce your number of decision making. So, what point do you think founders or CEOs should get like a personal assistant or receptionist or executive assistant? Oh, ASAP. ASAP. <laughs> okay. You know, the moment you find the right one, your productivity would increase at least an order of magnitude more. Because you spend so much time on redundant, mundane tasks, right? Like running around, uh, getting bank statements from the from a bank. Right? Why would you do that, right? If some, I think some founders from in the Silicon Valley, if you find the right chief of staff, um, the founder would even give them bank account credentials, you know. But you have to really trust the person, yeah. right? So you, so that person can can be you, right? Yeah. But but at the later later stage of the company. You not only need executive secretary or PA, personal assistant. You need one for non-work and one for work, by the way. You also need a chief of staff. Those who can filter out the noises and know you and know what you would decide in this situation and can think on, on behalf, can decide on your behalf. So that's another level. Like a, not a blue-collar job, like PA, executive secretary, exec, uh, secretary, white, uh, paperwork stuff, but really a white collar thinking, like where you can, you can uh, look. They, they have to be smart. Yeah, yeah, you can think on. I mean, it has to be like you know, like the White House, right? the right man, person of of the president. Okay, there's another level of executive secretary. And having achieved the you know the level of success that you have, what you know what. St- what gets you up in the morning? What is the drive that makes you, you know, continue to work? Um, and what's next for you? Entrepreneurs' journey are like roller coaster. Right? Right. One day you're winning all over the moon. Some days you're wondering within yourself, what am I doing here? Another crisis again. Can I just have a rest? Can we not have a peaceful year? You take holidays? Not, not before. Never in the past four, okay. four, five, four or five years. Yeah. I only started to try to take holiday um, recently because yeah. I had... That's another mistake that I made, by the way. Uh, the quality of decision making dropped a lot when I overworked, had little sleep um, and no rest. Uh, and productivity drops too. So I started to try, I had to have my secretary's book like a day off on my calendar um, and try to spend time with the family more. Is that like once a month, once a week? What's the frequency of your day off? Uh, once a week. Okay. And on, su- on Sunday, I would go and clean myself up. I would go to a preventive health cl- healthcare clinic. I spent half a million Thai baht, by the way, just to detox my body, like fatty liver. Uh, you know why my white blood cell is only 68, whereas an average person's white blood cell is 500, and a strong person's white blood cell is 3,000. So I'm way, way at the critical low level. 
So I had to re-inject the, the white blood cell back into the body. I had to detox all the metal, aluminum metal from my body out. I had to do acupuncture. I, I talked to psychologists. So it's a clean-up day for, to make sure that your tools, your body is so ready. So your off day is a health and performance, performance yeah. day. Okay. Yeah, performance so you work Saturdays too then? Yeah. And um, Saturday, I love Saturday because I don't have to join meetings, uh, and, meetings. and and <laughs> and and unblock and block others. On sun, Saturday, I can get to do my own work to catch up on yeah. my own work and strategize. And Sunday after the cleanup, like body cleanup, I would spend time with the family. So. Uh, it helps with the sustainability because knowing that we are entering, a, we're not running a sprint anymore. After we reach the equilibrium of network effect and economy of scale, once we conquer the market, um, we were aiming for sustainability phase. That's why we have to change. I have to change the lifestyle to be more sustainable because I can't work like this forever. Um, so again, a bit late um, that I you know, decided to change my behavior, but working on it. So you're saying like the entrepreneurial journey is, um, you know, ups and downs. And I asked you about, you know, what's next for you? Where do you plan to spend your time now during this, during this period? And, you know, is BitCup something that you're going to continue to do for the long term? Or have you had other ideas? Like, what do you see as, as next? Um, where is next for me? Um, I'm thinking of becoming a global citizen. I think the trend is is that everyone is becoming a global citizen, right? It's where you can live like three months, uh, you know, per year in one place, and then you migrate to another place, and you you move places around, and you build out a global business. I think that's the next ambition. I want to turn BitCup into a great company. Not just a good company. So does um, that mean BitCop has global ambitions to? We want to expand. Yeah. Beyond Thailand, so we are already becoming a national champion, but we want to have. Uh, we want to become a regional, regional company, and tap on global talents, and. You know, uh, I'm very proud that wherever I, wherever I go in Thailand, uh, every most mostly everyone is my customer. Everyone is using the products. Uh, you know, BitCup has 10 million apps downloads in Thailand on 10 million phones. Uh, a country with 70 million population, we have 10 million apps apps downloads on the phone. So one in seven has a BitCup app on their phone. Uh, and everywhere I go, everyone would know BitCup. Uh, we are becoming a household name uh, for the country. But we want to represent Thailand on a global stage. You know, at Davos, we were very proud to be yeah. one of the 11 representatives from the country. But we want, we want to build out a global business. After we have conquered Thailand, we want to have multiple regional offices. And also to turn become into a great company that, that represents some kind of values for the people. Um, good companies go for profit, but, but great companies go for... We're, we're becoming. We want to become a cult that represents like common sh shared values and goals uh, for the customers. Like Apple, Apple is a great company. I mean, I mean, nobody complains about Mac being thirty percent more exp expensive on average than other laptops, uh, but much slower. Right? When you buy a Mac product, you don't even compare prices anymore to alternative products. You just go from for Apple products, right? Because it they uh, it symbol uh, symbolize you, uh, common set of values, shared goals and values. We want to be breaching that great company stage, and inspire a lot more entrepreneurs to dare to to create great things. You know, recently I took a course. The, the first ever course that I took, DCP, Director Certificate Program, to become a board member, you have to take this course to be to get a company listed, and I want I want BitCup to be listed, and be a regional company, 
So I'm also preparing my staff, my management and myself to becoming a board member, to knowing how to act as a board versus how to act as a management. Um, and a case study was Nestle, right? Uh, um, coffee company, right? Um, they have to manage different stakeholders. As I shared earlier, there's different seven to nine to 10 stakeholders. And they have to publish a report every year. And they, after they research, the key stakeholders was actually farmers. They have to keep their farmers happy um, to make their business sustainable. So they need to invest a lot in the supply chain, manage their stakeholders well. And they got to the point that the shareholders would not be able to differentiate between a CSR versus the core business. Right, they cannot differentiate by reading the report. If this report is a CSR community stakeholder management report or the core mission vision of the company, and that's a good thing because because that means that this company got to the point that it is becoming an integral part of the society. That it is too important to 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 to, to be shut down. Right. They're doing something very meaningful. Um, I want to go back and and reflect on the mission. Why do we need, need another cryptocurrency company on this earth? Why do we get up every day, right? Why do we hassle, right? We need to have a strong why, right? So we need to go back to the mission and make sure that BitCup is a long-lasting company. And the vision is already clear to create a open financial system for the world, to create an open financial platform, and to disrupt, to to bring financial inclusion. The, those are like you know, a reachable, a reachable vision. But but the mission has to be long lasting and meaningful, and be an integral part of the society. I think that's the next step that we want to get Bitcup to become. What is your why? Your personal why? Initially, my why was very finite, not an yeah. infinite why. It's, back then, when I was not a good student, my why, my only goal in life was to get into a top school. So it's right. changed over time. Yeah. Different Oxford goal University. posts, right? Yeah. And, but, but I only had one goal per chapter at a time. So my only goal was to get into Oxford University. And I, did every, I sacrificed everything else for this goal. And for for the first company, my why was my goal was just to prove everyone wrong who despised me, right? Who thought Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme? It's a it's a good motivator, isn't it? <laughs> Proving people wrong. <laughs> yeah, to slap people <laughs> in the face. <laughs> yeah. But Told that's so. not that's not long lasting. You know? <laughs> yeah. And and Bitcup the initial goal was to become the first fintech unicorn. Yeah. But that's not long lasting that finite, right? After we reached that status, quite a few employees left the company. You know, they did completed their checkbox. Yeah, been there, done that, goodbye. Right? It's not long lasting, it's not infinite thinking. So I still need to go back uh, to the core mission to reflect with the team. Why do we need another tech company in this world? Why do we need another cryptocurrency on this earth? Why do we get up every morning? Uh, it has to be infinite, long-lasting why. And still working on it. Still working on it. So that's the next phase, I guess. Yeah. And so just before we wrap up, you know, any sort of imparting wisdom you would share with uh, founders in terms of scaling their businesses? In terms of specifically specifically scaling their businesses yeah maybe not uh blitz scaling but you know just anything you would share with with founders any advice at all about growing their businesses well for the founders that have already found the product market fit and about to scale i would highly encourage you to find a coach having the right team is important having the right timing is important but having the right coach and the right sounding board, it would help you a lot from repeating my mistakes. You know, if I could go back in time, 
I would try my best to find the right board members to to warn me what the next chapter would be. Um, not backwards looking, but forward looking. Right. Um, so you cannot do this alone. You cannot. You're not Elon Musk. I'm not Elon Musk. Right? Nobody can do this alone. You have to have the right team under you. But you, we always, we often for, forget to have the right team on top of you as well as a founder. It's, it can. It should not be a lonely journey. You know, join like YPO, join EO, Founders Club. You know, share vulnerabilities, share your experiences. Most of the founders, entrepreneurs went through the same stuff, same experiences. Make sure you have the right people on top of you who can uh, remind you um, of what's next. It's also important, and it would save you a lot of time and mistakes. Thank you for sharing. Um, so, where can people find you online? Where's the best place? Oh, I'm I'm everywhere. I'm on <laughs> all the social media: Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Which TikTok, which channel do you look IG. after yourself? <laughs> no, no, I have seven secretaries, so I have five oh, no. more to. Is there a channel where you know you personally check it yourself? Sometimes, but usually it's the team. Okay. And everyone would redirect all the important messages to me. Okay. On on Slack. So just just a word out there: you got to make sure your message is important if you want to reach top. <laughs> Okay, that's great. So I, I guess that they can just do a, a search for your name, Top Juryot, on Google, and all your socials will come up. Yeah. I'll, I'll drop some uh, some of Top's links in the in the comments as well. So amazing to chat with you today. Really appreciate your time, and thank you so much. And just for me as well, I'm the CEO of Primal, a uh, leading digital agency in Thailand and Malaysia. Um, and I'll drop my social links as well into the comments uh, below as well. So. Thank you so much, Tom. Really appreciate you being here today. Thank you for having me. Cool. Awesome. That's it.